Welcome to our um, Friday lecture series. Uh, we are at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte at the College of Arts and Architecture and uh, at the Department of Art and, and Art History. And uh, I have a great pleasure to host this uh, session with Janet Williams. And also uh, a really great pleasure to introduce our guest tonight, to the tonight, today, not tonight, I'm sorry, <laughs> this morning. Um, and uh, this is fantastic opportunity for, for all of us to be introduced to Adamed Delphine Fabundu. And um, welcome, to, welcome to Charlotte, welcome to UNCC. And before we start, and before I ask Adamet to start our pre her presentation, I would like to maybe quickly uh, remind everybody about amazing um, and fascinating career of our guest tonight, tonight, today, I'm sorry, not tonight. Um, Adama is a photographer and visual artist born in Brooklyn, New York, to parents from Sierra Leone and Equatorial Guinea in West Africa, with over 15 years experience working as a photographer. Uh, Adama enhanced her studio practice and completed her MFA in visual arts from Columbia University in 2018. In recognition of her artistic practice, she received the Rima Hortman Emerging Artist Award and was named one of Okaya's Africa, 100 women making an impact on Africa and its diaspora, and was included in the Royal Photographic Society of UK, 100 Heroines show. In 2018, um, Adama was an, an, excuse me, in 2018, other awards included New York Foundation of Arts, photo, excuse me, New York Foundation of Arts Photography Fellow, Brooklyn Art Council Grant, Open Society Foundation Community Fellow, the Brooklyn Historical Society Community Initiative Grant, Brick Works, Workspace Artist in Residence. Adama has exhibited internationally with solo shows in 2019 at the African American Museum in Philadelphia and Crash Curatorial Gallery in Chelsea, New York City. Her works can be found in private and public collection, such as the Brooklyn Museum of Art, the Brooklyn Historical Society, the Norton Museum of Art Corridor Ga Art Gallery. It's very important to mention that Adama is also co-founder and editor-in-chief mm -hmm. of Women Photographers of the African Diaspora, very important publication, uh, which was highly recognized in the United States and overseas. Welcome to our talk. Okay, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen. Hello, Charlotte and everyone who's joining from around, hopefully uh, global, globally as well. Um, my name is Adama Delphine Fawundu and I will be presenting work about just like my career and the, later, the, later, the projects that I've been working on lately. Here's a quote that I will share with you. Um, there is a thing passing in the sky, some thick clouds surround it. The un in uninitiated sees nothing. It's a Mende pro proverb. And I really um, think about this quote often as I start to think about how the our knowledge set and what we think we know about the world and our surroundings and society and how that impacts who we are and how we see ourselves. It's, it, it seems like something so simple, but it's really, I think about how uncovering histories has informed my art, artistic practice, just being an African woman, a black woman living in this world and the way that we receive history and how systems such as colonialism and slavery has been put in place to make us feel inferior. Right. And so when I think about this quote, I think about how my journey of uncovering histories and really getting to the bo bottom of things and practically trying to decolonize my mind, what it has done to free myself. And hopefully, um, you know, on this journey, we begin to free ourselves from the chains of colonialism. So I'm heavily impacted by um, some many things. This book, Radiance from the Waters, which I shared a small um, reading with you from. Sylvia Arden Boone, who's the author, is the first African-American woman to receive her um, tenure from Yale University. And her research in this book has heavily impacted my work and my journey. Um, also, I have these uh, Mende masks, a Sawo mask, which I'm constantly referring back to my 
heritage, my Mende heritage, and also my Krim heritage, which is from my father's side, and my Bube heritage from my mother's side. And I like to use the, um, the names of the people and the cultures that I am referring to, because I also like to think about, you know, nations, Mende, the Mende nation, rather than Sierra Leone, you know, because of this colonial construct is pro problematic. And I think that when we start to look at ourselves and, and, and think about different ontologies, you start to look at your world differently. Um, some other books that I'm interested in and have been inspired by is the um, research of Marimba Ani or Dana Marimba Richards, Michael Gomez and Edouard Glissant. And I love the way that they're talking about the diaspora. And from reading these um, texts, it's, it's a part of my uncovering. On my journey with me, through my works, Audre Lorde, Ntozaki Shange, Octavia Butler, Anton Willem Amo, so many writers have influenced me because I'm always reading. I spend a lot of time in the archives. It heavily, heavily influences me. I consider myself to be a research-based artist. I'm also um, heavily inspired by my grandmother. This is my grandma, Adama. And this photo of her, the one that is repeated, is the photo that I had of her while I was growing up in Brooklyn and she was far away in Sierra Leone. I only met her twice in my life and um, my relation to her and my connection to her and my and Sierra Leone was through the fabrics, the hand dyed fabrics that she would send to me. And so today I use a lot of that work that those fabrics and the practice of making the fabrics in my work I'm inspired by layering and making patterns and I can't I'm, I'm we're kind she's with me on this journey like I have so much respect for my ancestors and like I'm named after her and together we're working on this journey in this journey and here's a piece that I made called Mende Uman and Uman means woman and it's kind of like the me looking in, she's looking out, and it's this exchange between myself and the ancestors. I think about um, ideas of Sankofa, retrieving the past in order to create the future. So I'm always thinking about life in cycles and our existence in cycles. Here are some of the fabrics that she made and that I still have with me. Many of these fabrics that I have are um, were made in the 60s and in the 70s, and I still have them, and I'm constantly scanning them and using them to make work. So I'll share with you my first series, Passageways, Secrets, Traditions, Spoken and Unspoken Truths or Not. And I think about this, in this series, I'm thinking a lot about, again, those histories. I'm thinking about the secrets of the past from generation to generation, the oral histories, the, the written histories, and not just within my family, but between Africa and the diaspora. To me, the connection between Africa and this diaspora is extremely important, and I think that the, the exchange of information needs to be circular in order to promote growth and freedom. And um, here I am pictured with, it's, it's a stage photo, I'm pictured with my mother. And, um, and I think the picture, like for you, there's so many reads to this picture, but there's really, there's, it's about the sharing of stories. It's about the connection, it's, a, it's an intergenerational connection as well. And it is about that passageways, the passageways. The borders are made with fabrics that I collect. I'm wearing a dress that is um, that was hand dyed by my grandmother, but then worn by my mom in the 70s. And then now I have it and I perform in it often. And here's another photo from the Passageway series where I'm um, performing with my godmother. And again, it's kind of that the, the exchange is happening. And there are many elements in the photos, like at the bottom, you'll see there's water, um, there's an American flag, and I, I'm constantly putting different symbols into the, um, the photos to just add layers to the depth of their meanings. Here is uh, myself kind of remixing my grandmother's fabrics and making this massive pattern set out of it. And I like to think of my work as language making where I'm sampling. I am very influenced by hip hop culture because I think it's just another way of making language. And the idea of sampling, what it does is it technically samples you know, beats and then remakes and makes something new out of it. But I think that that's what happens in the, 
in the in the diaspora. When you look at people's languages, you look at the language of African Americans, you look at the language in the Caribbean, and what it's doing is sampling parts of the English language or other European languages, but using a syntax from a West African language. And I think that that is a powerful thing that the human mind does. And I like to look at that way. And that's what hip hop does, right? It's sampling and making new languages. And I like to use that way of making work. So you'll see my work has, even in the previous works, a sampling, sampling, putting together to make something new. I use this backdrop as I, I make um, wallpaper. So this was a wallpaper in a show that I did in um, at the Moody Center in Texas. Also, here's a, a remake of, again, I'm putting these, this, this series is called Body Vernacular. And here I am making these languages with my body using layering um, fabrics and found fabrics. I, I like the, the, the back, Round is a wallpaper, and it really reminds me of growing up in the 70s in my mom's living room where wallpaper was the thing, <laughs> you know? And I think about what, what immigrants bring with them to a new country and how they literally make their own language in their domestic spaces. So it's a nice merge, and, and I feel that's what my life is, is this merge of cultures, you know, and which... And, hopefully we could understand that when cultures merge in a peaceful way that good things could come out of it and that you know we should allow ourselves to understand different cultures and you know live humanely in that way see the benefit of that here's another series these are these are all the body vernacular and i just number them Vadi Banakala number one, two, three, four. There's about 11 of these in the series. The background here is one of the, um, the fabrics that my grandmother dyed back, you know, in the 70s. And some of the poses are familiar, some are unfamiliar. And for myself, I this I use myself mostly in the work. So all of these images that you're looking at besides the ones with my mom or my godmother are me. And I like to use myself and just transform myself because I'm also thinking about masking, which is very present in Mende culture and the power of masking and how things are done, you're able to enter another, another realm when you're masked. And I like to think about that as I think about introspection and how I have to almost mask myself to be present in this world and process what is happening in this world. I'm gonna share a, a excerpt of a film that I made, it's called The Cleanse. And this film is me like really, the first time that I use sound in my work and um, with this, the sound, I considered my, I actually did the, the process of sampling different pieces, putting it together to make a new um, piece. I, I sampled a bunch of text from people that I really respected and said the words together to make piece, the, the different lines together to make a full text. And then there's just this process of transformation with my hair. So here you go. There, there is a woman, there is magic. If there is a moon falling from her mouth, she is a woman who knows her magic. Who can share or not share her powers. A woman with a moon falling from her mouth, roses between her legs and tiaras of Spanish moss. This woman is a consort of the spirit. So that's just a snippet of it. Um, the video is actually 10, um, 10 minutes long, so I, I couldn't play the whole thing. But really what it does is it transforms my hair in the shower from being straightened to coming back to its natural state. And it's really, again, about that transformation of life, you know, everything is the full circle. The Sacred Star of Isis is a series that I began in 2017. 
And um, it involved me traveling frequent, traveling back and forth to Sierra Leone to make work there, but also within the African diaspora. So this work was made in Argentina, um, in New York, in Nigeria, in different parts. And I was really thinking about the idea of movement. I used the um, deity Mami Wata as a, as a departure, a, a point of departure where I imagined what it would be like if a deity such as, a water deity such as her, or thinking about other water deities like Yamaya, who are from African spiritual religions. And I thought about what would happen if they transformed and shapeshifted. Here I am being inspired by Octavia Butler in different spaces and kind of claimed their, their presence in these different spaces. And it's interesting to me why I was interested in the deities is because even if you go to places like Brazil or you go to you know New York City and it's at many places in diaspora, you see there's still this connection, this strong spiritual connection to Africa through these deities. And I found that to be a really interesting as well. So um, here is a mixed media piece. This When this plays, the eyes, there's actually water and moving in the eyes. And um, the, the, at the bottom of the, of the frame, there's the, the raffia is from Sierra Leone. I have fabric. The lace is from my mother's collection of fabrics. I have hair. There's sea moss from Savannah. There's so many different elements that are pieced together in the, the, the I don't even know what to call it, the skirt, the dress thing that's coming from the chin. But to me, it's kind of like, these beings that I'm creating, these powerful deities that I am creating that could inhabit anywhere on this earth. So I'm very much into Afrofuturism and, um, and just thinking about, you know, ourselves as a part of this growing earth and universe and really thinking about the connections that we have to our, you know, to every, to the universe, to the earth, to each other and the power in that. This is another part of the installation. And the video, this is a snippet of the video that was just Church. Deep inside of 
Ya sabe, ve a vingir coelho, ok? Ya sabe, ve a vingir coelho. Ando e pé a caô, ya ando e pé, ando e pé a caô, ya. Ya ma e ando e pé a caô, ya, ya o. Ando e pé a caô, ya ando e pé, ando e pé a caô, ya. So this video is called Deep Inside on Blue. And it was made, like I said, in various parts of the world using this idea of sampling life in order to piece a story together. Here's another piece, again, thinking about masking, water, like some of the, um, the themes that come up in my work or elements that come up in my work are masking, water, fabric, cotton, patterns. And I think I look at this photo often, it's called water mask. And, I, and every time I look at it, I'm seeing something new. And it, it makes me even think about, you know, the idea of what your mind allows you to see and what it means to continuously come back. And is there something terrifying about this? Is there something calming about it? You know, it kind of keeps me back and forth in a, in a space as I continue to look at it. Um, in this series here, um, I have... And it might be a little difficult to see, but it's I'm also constantly working with my hands, making assemblage. Again, thinking about the the way of um, making from inspired by my grandmother in piecing all of these images, juxtaposing images together to make these new pieces that you almost feel like you could enter into. This definitely my work my work is definitely also about world making. This piece is called Meet Me in Another World. And the headpiece has all those, as there's a cowry shell from Sierra Leone, the raffia from Sierra Leone, I have the sea moss from Savannah. My actual hair is inside the piece. I'm not sure if you can see in here, I have my actual hair is in there. I collect my hair every time I comb it and I get extra hair, I have like tons of my hair that I collect and put it into the work every now and then. In the Face of History is a is, is a really exciting project for me because I love to I live in the archives and any opportunity to be in the archives is just a pleasure for me, and I started this piece by um, wanting to um, do a screen printing project and I started thinking about this idea of what it means to witness history and what does it mean to reinterpret what does it mean to I almost look at this as a metaphysical type of experience where the body is experiencing different points in time in history. Um, also the interrogation of history, because I look at these archives here, we have um, let us guide our own destiny. This is a, a, a actually a marketing piece from the black star line, Marcus Garvey's black star line music, um, movement and and where he was trying to um to set up trade between b blacks in america and the africa and the caribbean how powerful is that right back in the eight in the late 1800s when um you know the irish had their steamships going back and forth different people europeans had their steamships and trading amongst each other and he said well we could do this too and he successfully set it up, but then it was intercepted by, you know, spies and it was taken down. But I think about how this type of liberation movement could be so inspiring when you think about just history, throughout history, and how I didn't have access to this information going into high, in high school at all, you know? And these are documents that are living in the archives. And so with this series, I found so many different archives and I created a huge wall as you could see. And so when people came, 
it's overwhelming, but they wanted to go in and read documents. People kept looking at different documents. So many of these documents relate to histories that just have not been revealed, histories of violence, histories of progression. It's so many different um, archives that I've gotten from America, but also globally as well, that just reveal so much. And this, um, this project, it was interesting to go to Ghana and do a version of this um, project where I showed the cleanse, but then I also was in the Usher Fort, um, which was used as a point of trading people, you know, enslaved people in um, Jamestown in Accra, Ghana. So it was really interesting to now be in this monument right this 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 huge monument but then take these documents and then put them onto these historical documents and actually place them onto that wall and have people engage i have never had any the, there was over 10,000 people that attended this outdoor street um, art festival and i've never experienced that it, you know I don't think I've ever experienced that type of art festival with so many different, not just art goers. These are people from all walks of life who were heavily engaged in the, it was such an ex, uh, exciting experience. And so here I used, you know, the wall to just kind of put these posters up. I mean, it was a big deal because the people who were running the place, they were like, can't you just make sure that it's removable? I'm like, yes, it will be removable. But it was really a good experience because people asked me about, the, the photo, the um, this one here with the ship and people were like, is it a slave ship? And I said, no, let's look closer. There's actually an office in Accra, that was in Accra, Ghana, one in London and one in New York City. And I thought, wow. And over here, you know, Mediterranean, USA, Canada, and we were thinking and just to think and they were shocked and wanted to know more. And so it makes me think again about this connection that history brings to us that could that what history can inspire us to do for the future. Next, um, over the pandemic, I um, I, right before the pandemic, I was supposed to do a project for the Park Avenue Armory to commemorate 100 years since the ratification of the 19th Amendment to allow um, women to vote. And so with this, um, I thought, okay, how about bring in the face of history, but use documents that relate to women and voting. And so that's exactly what I did. But my initial project was to make a, like a, a um, quilt a translucent quilt that would hang like a flag in the space, but then COVID happened and we were all refined to our homes. So I had to think of another, they said, do something that's digitally digital. So thinking, I said, well, maybe I can make a cape. So I made a cape that for me, like capes embody so much, you know, when you think about what it means to drape something over your body, this kind of protection and how I can make a cape move. And I thought I will use Prospect Park, which is near me as my studio, and I will just perform and make a video out of it. And so it was definitely a, um, a intuitive process, but I'll play aspects of it. So this is called In the Face of History Freedom Cape. As, as as much as you know, it is about go vote, it is about disrupting and dismantling every system that has built in this country on white supremacy that oppresses us, which includes our democratic process. Um, the realities that we face is that this is the system that's in place. What's the alternative for us in our communities if we don't vote? We need to disrupt the system. So, but my question is, can we disrupt the system from inside? Is it one or the other? Is it voting or disrupting the system? Or do we um, encourage people to vote as we're finding ways to dismantle or disrupt systemic racism? So how do we actually break out of these systems that we have been sort of sequestered into the last several hundred years beyond, you know, just us being black people, us being black women as people in this country. What what is the new thing? Because obviously what we have is not working. The fact that the streets are on fire across the country is obviously, you know, speaking to that. And so it's not enough to just go vote as is, but how can we reimagine and rebuild the democracy that includes us as full citizens and not only three, four? How do we do something else. What is the new thing? What are the new systems that we can build? How are we exploring 
a beloved community and a visionary future where we are not just surviving, but we are thriving. Like where we are not on defense, but we are telling people what we want and then we get it. So the interesting thing about this video is that I, um, it was happening as our world was unfolding. I'm making this thing and our world is literally unfolding <laughs> horrific things, you know, in the middle of me making this George Floyd happened, uh, you know, Ahmaud Arbery was happening and like that black lives matter mural was not there. And once it was, I was like, at the last edit, I'm like, do I go include the mural in the video? So it was just kind of this intuitive, make it as you go along. Um, it's actually a 10, uh, like eight to 10 minute video. So you actually see me in the full video, you see me sewing the quilt. So there's a process of me making, performing in, but then also um, this is like a good example of me just kind of being in tune with what was happening real time. But this work, understanding that my work has always been concerned about social injustice and all of these things that are happening and how can our knowledge set free us from that here i'm i'm in you know in the cape in front of um a historic the lefferts home in prospect park and the lefferts home was a place that had enslaved people so it was something again, you know, to see like even the role of black women for freedom and um, and voting, you know, voting rights in America during, you know, as we look at this, as we, I was engaged in the project, I want to have that conversation as well. This is a close up of the print and I love um, Ntozaki Shange. So every moment that I have to include her words in my work, it's there. Here I am sampling again to make these pieces. And there's another performance of the quote. And this brings me to um, Sun Sun in Mind, Body and Spirit, another piece that I was making mid pandemic. Um, the exhibition was supposed to launch in February in Germany, but um, the pandemic slowed everything down. And here I am kind of editing and you know, sending them the work. And you just, it was like, as soon as I got back from Germany, we were on lockdown and it was install, I installed the piece and then here I, and I had to kind of, I think I needed to deliver the final piece the, by before the end of maybe mid March or something like that. I'm confused because 2020 is a blur. But anyway, it was inspired by the philosophy of Anton Willem Amo. And this is a time that I really got a chance to engage with a scholar that I had no idea about this African scholar. And I sent you all this text, so you know, um, the text to this, so you know who he is, but who knew? Like in grad school, we're learning about, you know, philosophers, Kant and all of these people. And this, he was a contemporary. So why is his name not in those conversations? Imagine how more, you know, enlightened we would be if we really, if we had a full, at least a holistic view of history and the contributions that many different people made. So with us, for uh, the challenge that I was given for this exhibition was to make a piece that not dealt, not really just responded to the fact that he was this um, Ghanaian philosopher who was amazing, but also about his concept of the mind, body, and spirit, which is what I feel like my work speaks to anyway. So I made these pieces. This is, I'm going to just show you, this is, like the installation. I made these pieces thinking about this idea of, of the separation of mind and body. Wait, I'm not sure what happened. Let me see. Okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. These are just the birds on the, um, and there's a projection on the background. Also, I made a book that um, that kind of does the same process of sampling and putting together. So these are pieces of the book and this is the body in the series. I'm constantly using hair and um, thinking about past, you know, thinking about, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't show the excerpt of the video of this. I thought I had that with me, but I don't. Sorry about that. But this this book, like it, it's showing, I'm really thinking about that movement again and using the hair in that way. 
Um, the way that I constructed this book was definitely in a um, intuitive way. That it, it kind of formed itself. Here's another piece. Um, it's a mixed media piece, Risen from the Waters. And rising from the waters are, is, are clouds of hair. There's um, sage. If you come close to these pieces, you'll smell the sage. Um, excuse me, I just want to remind us about time. I know, I just saw, I just saw uh, that we are going, okay. <laughs> I want you to finish this, this body, of course, but. Okay, I'll just show, I'm good. I'm, I'm almost there, works in progress. Sure. So now these last pieces that I'm gonna show you is a collaboration between me and my grandmother where I've been sampling some of her works and making cyanotypes out of them and then making my own patterns. So all of these have a bit of me and her in them. And yeah. And that's it. <laughs> okay. What a fantastic journey. I really, really, uh, I think everybody appreciate that. We, we uh, I, I felt like a kind of after months of struggling here, being stuck in, uh, in Charlotte at home, you took us for an amazing, um, you know, geographical, cultural journey. Thank you. Uh, we have a, a lot of questions from from uh, from students, but I actually actually I'm tempted to squeeze one question which might relate to our conversation we have before mm -hmm. uh, before our presentation today. Talking about Africa, kind of in general terms, is very difficult because we have a tendency to kind of generalize and say Africa. You know, it's a huge mm -hmm. continent. It's much bigger than uh, it's shown on European maps. Yeah. It's it's, stag it's, it's staggering. It's mm -hmm. extremely diverse in terms of the cultures, languages, ethnicity. I mean, if you look at the South and North and the West and East, it's absolutely stunning. Therefore, talking about Africa in general terms, it's always very tempting, but also very kind of misleading. Mm -hmm. But there is something I want to mention, which um, you probably heard about and you probably maybe recognize yourselves. And it's actually, I think, important to mention in context of, of your work, which is focusing on women, mm -hmm. on yourself and the women experience. Many people think and many people say that Africa is run by the woman. Mm. Africa is a place where women from, you know, housekeeping to education, to healthcare, to mm. economics, to politics, every aspect of African life is pretty much dominated by extremely powerful and active women who are, mm. you know, historically and even contemporary times are playing a leading role um, on every stage of uh, societal life. Mm -hmm. And I wonder about your opinion about it, um, uh, your observation about it as your own art and observation, but also how this actually relates to um, African-American women who are also extremely active. You know, I mean, if you look at the Black Lives Matters, women are the very forefront of this movement. Mm -hmm. And do you see any kind of relation between African continent you know, at, at large, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, and we can talk about a little bit about that, but also how do you see in relation to African-American women who um, obviously, I mean, last four years at least is showing tremendous, tremendous leadership. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think it's such a great um, point that you bring up. And what it makes me think about is the, this tension between the traditional and, you know, the colonized way, right? So the colonized way is that this a hierarchy, men, women, right? And, but what's fighting against that is this idea of the matriarch, you know? And it's something that I'm so familiar with. Right now, my, my great aunt is 93 years old and she is the respected chief of Mano, which is where my family is from in Sierra Leone on my father's side. And there is a level of so much respect. I mean, my mother is considered the matriarch of our Sierra Leonean community one of them. So if someone is having problems, whatever, they're coming to her out of respect to get advice, you know? So the idea that there, there is this, it's just, it's just who we are. You know, we are strong and powerful people as women and making, um, you know, even if it's behind the scenes, you know what I mean? And because even when you think here, like I've just, just from being here and the, what I know about African-American culture and Caribbean culture, the role of the woman in that traditional sense is a strong one and is a powerful one and, um, and needs to be respected as, as such. And it's interesting 
when we, that tension, but there is that tension because when we look in, you know, at the laws and society and the things that you have to fight for, you know, as a woman as well, there's kind of that tension between who we are. And that's why I go back to this idea of our knowledge set, because it's easy also to internalize, um, you know, sexism and all of those different isms, but in the sense of how we just act and how we are and what we do and what we're capable of doing, Absolutely. I was just reading a, a text by um, a, a doctor. Well, she was an educator based in Brooklyn. Her name was Susan McKinney. And she gave a speech back in the 1800s about healthcare and med medicine. And she said, women have been doctors, you know, and it's documented back to the sacred text. And I'm like, how powerful is that? You know, and, and just to know, like, it's just a part of who we are back to the sacred text when we knew, you know, we knew, we had to know about the body. And it, so it just to know, it's just not just the domestic, it's science, it's different things. And it goes back to, again, this uncovering, because I want to know when I read about Anton Willem Amo and some other philosophers from um, Ethiopia, you know, black African philosophers, I said, okay, now we're the woman, because I know that they're there. We just don't have access to them. Right. Mm -hmm. So let's let's um, switch to actual question from our uh, our students. Uh, this is a question from um, Ajane, um, and I'm reading from her question. I noticed in your passageway series that there are a plethora of overlapping textures in the background, and reminds me of uh, Samuel Fosso, the chief who sold Africa to the colonies. Mm. Did you gain inspiration from his photograph or technique? I didn't. All of those those fabrics are really inspired by my grandmother's methods of um, fabric making. So when I saw that, I thought about that. But then I also thought about um, Malik Sadibe and thinking about you know the backgrounds that he would make in order to create this you know this the studio look. So I really was inspired more so by layering ideas um, that came from me and my heritage, but then also thinking about the idea of the sea and the impact that the ocean has, the Atlantic, ash, um, the Atlantic ash, um, oh, ocean has on, on the diaspora. Yeah. Fantastic. Another question, uh, this is from Malik. Uh, the photography has a history of uh, participating in colonizing and documenting the world. Being mm -hmm. aware of that and social climate we are right now, do you find yourself working around photographic terms that alludes to violence, shooting or, um, or capturing? Absolutely. When I teach my students, that's one of the things that we talk about, like that, you know, um, Africa, I mean, the camera was used as a colonizing tool, you know, and it's extremely, it had a very extremely violent beginning, you know, and what I think is most powerful is the idea of taking that same tool and using it in a different way and being aware of the, you know, that there are acts of violence that you can create and that is a privilege to hold the camera in your hand. And it's one of the reasons why I, um, I've, I've really been turning the camera on myself and really seeing how much, it's a challenge. How many times can you photograph yourself, right? And so it's, it's but one thing too, this question really reminds me of the um, Zeely daguerreotypes, which is something that I've been um, reading. I just bought the book uh, and, you know, Carrie Mae Weems had access to the these, um, these daguerreotypes that were made in a horrific way, like to, to photograph African-Americans who were enslaved and how she took those photographs and turned them into something completely um, completely new and was sued because she did it against Harvard University's permission. And just to think about like that, that tension, but now everything is fine, you know, things were, were, were but the, the act of saying, I'm going to take this back, you know, and that's how I feel about the camera. I'm going to take this tool. I like to destruct the, the boundaries of photography, as you can see. You didn't see many formal photographs because I like to destruct the boundaries and the idea of what the photograph is as a way to kind of resist and push back against the violence of the medium. Fantastic, very good question. Mm -hmm. um, 
This is uh, this question is from Amber. <clears throat> I read the ex excerpts from Radiance from the Waters and pair it, pair it with your work Passageways. Do you feel comfortable talking more about the world Hele and also Kpova in your work and attempt at Hele and the result on an affront to Kpova? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, for me, I use it's like I like to use it as a reference point. Like I, I'm thinking about the idea of the best way to say it to me is right now, I consider myself to be this being that's living in this world, right? And a world that literally on paper says you're less than, you're this, your hair is this, your color is this, blah, 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 blah. So I have tapping into that knowledge set, right? what it does is it gives me a whole entire different way of seeing the world, period. So I'm not even thinking so much in that period of time. And, you know, because of course things evolve and things change. I'm really thinking about taking this idea and bringing it into the contemporary, because I feel like we, one thing, and, and one of the reasons why we're facing problems such as climate change and all of that, these crazy things that we're dealing with today is because we, have taken indigenous thought and belief and called it secondary. We call it barbaric, we call it savagery, and we call it all of these different things. And now we need to go into this original thought to think about how to save our world. So for me, it's really about having a respect for the, a, a different way of looking and being in the world. And then thinking not necessarily that I'm going to like abide by these rules and like be in that place, but how can I use that information to evolve as a point of evolution rather than starting with something that tells me that I come from savages. Great. Uh, <clears throat> another important question I think everybody would like to probably know. Hmm. You were born in uh, New York. When, you, when did you travel first to Sierra Leone, Nigeria and other places? Mm -hmm. and uh, how this was, was changing your actual work. I think that I'm going to, this is a question from Nikki and I, and I maybe add some, something from myself, which I think might be important for the students. Can you talk more about, uh, you mentioned at the very beginning that your, research, your work is pretty much inspired by your research mm -hmm. and how important it is, and especially for our students to kind of, if you talk about how uh, your work was informed by your travels and kind of, you know, yeah expanding your extending your expanding your horizons and going to places meeting people and engaging with them uh, if you can elaborate on that okay yes for sure I, I went to Sierra Leone for the first time when I was four years old and interestingly enough a lot of the photos that you see with the curtains and everything those are my my especially the one with the face behind the the okay. curtain my my first my old fondest memory of Sierra Leone are curtains and then now I connect that to these, um, you know, to the colonial structures that were in place. You know, we lived, they lived, my family lived in Freetown. And um, I had the opportunity to go back in 2011 to Freetown. And then I went again in 2017. Yeah. So those were the times that I went to Sierra Leone. But then in between that, for some reason, I've been in Nigeria, like from 2010 all the way up to 2019 every year and then Ghana and then you know South Africa like I've been traveling very much throughout the continent and there were different things that were bringing me back and forth there um for one this interest in um, hip-hop culture and it's beginning in New York City and then it going to having some influence it's being rooted in indigenous African culture. So when we think about the idea of call and response and the, you know, the, the syncopated beats and all of that, and then it having some impact on the youth in the world and particularly in, in different African cities. So what you haven't seen today is a 10 year um, series of me engaging with youth in men in like in seven African cities over 10, over like a good 10 years. Right, um, it's just a, a huge thing. So that's what had me going back and forth. But in that trip, I'm paying attention to so many different things that relates to the work that I'm showing to you now. So before, like I'm always reading, like um, listening to music, Fela Kuti, 
listening to his music just gives me a complete history, <laughs> like a portion of history of Nigerian, you know, a Nigerian history, which makes me want to read more, you know, and then I get baffled over ideas of how the president now could be the same president that he was singing about, you know, so there's so many different things that like that I start to, to read and engage in that um, has me talking to people and, and just the experience of being there allows me to create, you know, so, so it's like this, it, ha it doesn't happen in a, in a uniform way. It happens like with through memories, through notes. I keep journals, and you know, I inter I have tons of interviews with people. So um, yeah, so it's just like going back and forth, going back and forth between reading, traveling, interviewing people. It's it's amazing, yeah. And and then the thing that you end up with is all of the your archive. So how how my practice includes collecting collecting photographs, collecting video collecting um, archival material, I mean, material. So when I'm going, I'm collecting carry shells. I don't know what I'm doing with these things. They end up in my work. I'm collecting all of these things that I'm attracted to, fabrics, and then they come home with me to my studio and then I start to make. So it's just, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process that's, that's like this. <laughs> yeah, it's a long process now that I think about it. I mean, I feel like in 2008, is when I made the trip to, um, you know, after 95, when I went to South Africa in 2008 is when I went back to the continent. I don't know if you, in, in, there was a long civil war in Sierra Leone that kept me away from there for a very long time, which was very um, dramatic. traumatic. Um, but so in, 90, in 95, you know, I went to South Africa, came back 2008, I was like, I have to go, I have to go. And it was Ghana, but then from Ghana, it was Nigeria, then back to Sierra Leone, and then all of these different places. Uh, obviously, a big part, you know, I mean, looking at your work, big part of, uh, of, of your goal is to communicate with people, to have a kind of open conversation and communication. So I think the question from Alan is, is important. How do you define the success of a piece of art? If it makes you feel something that, and ask questions, if when you look at my art, you feel something and it makes you want to know something else and you go and find out something else, then my work is done. <laughs> I, I just want you to think, I want people to think beyond what it is that they already know and to ask questions and learn something new. And I feel like that's what art, art if my art is doing that, then, and also if you could feel something, I, when I make these worlds, if you come to one of my installations, it's like you're stepping into a new world. And it, even though you may not be able to, because I'm me, you can't be me, but if you could connect to what you're feeling, even if you can't put it into words, it's fine because that's what art does. Like it moves us to think. So if there's, if there's a sense of healing that comes through the work, if there's a, a sense of inquiry that comes through the work, then then that to me that's a, that's successful. We are uh, we just got the new administration. Uh, we um, depending of, of course of one's political views, but it, it's going to be dramatic. Is it is already a dramatic transition from last one. Uh, I think for all of us artists or creatives, last last year and this year um, as well, it's going to be time of kind of possibly re-evaluating our practice, thinking about the future where we, there is probably big influence of last, last event, last year events. Um, so the question for you, maybe kind of last one to wrap up this um, amazing uh, morning, what, what's the future? Where would you like to go? What, what, how do you see, as we're going to be able to travel again and engage more with people, how do you see yourself re-engaging and, and how uh, those last months were influencing your, um, uh, your art, your idea about art. Yeah, I just can't wait to get on a plane and leave. <laughs> I cannot wait. I mean, before pre-pandemic, 2020 was supposed to be, interestingly enough, was supposed to be a European tour where I really want to connect with, um, there's some histories that I've been reading about in, um, in Italy and um, and I have family in Spain and there's more that I want to do in Spain. And I've been attracted to Germany. Uh, when I was in Braunschweig, 
photographing and doing all of this research. So I'm really interested in, in the diaspora in Europe. And so I want to, to do some more work there. I'm also interested in more parts of America. When I traveled to the South, especially to Tennessee, I was in Tennessee and Memphis, and there was something in my spirit that was like, you need to be here making work. And so I want to travel more throughout America, Europe, and definitely more in Africa and the Caribbean. Like, you know, I want to, I'll tell you this. When I was younger, I would look at the map and I would just point to different places that, <laughs> that I want to go to. And I didn't know why, because I'm talking about, I would just look in the encyclopedias and read about countries. And this is me in elementary school. And now it's making so much sense. Like, it's just this need to, I have this saying, like, if, if I don't see, how do I know if it exists if I can't experience it, right? So I think, um, you know, the world is almost like, it's, it's a resource. It's a resource for creating and for, um, for thinking and, and in this day, I'm really, really interested in our climate more and more so, like making it intentional. I'm interested in how we're um, interacting with our with the water and with the land. And so I'm thinking about how my art can also amplify that conversation as well. I think that, you know, this, this is probably going to be great inspiration for all of us, what you just said. I, you, you mentioned something very interesting, and maybe this should be a last question, which um, um, I find is quite fascinating. Maybe the, the relation between European African diaspora and they, many of um, Africans who live in Europe, they are kind of constantly traveling between Africa and Europe. Mm -hmm. They have this ongoing connection and conversation, kind of going back and forth, which is very different than for majority of African Americans. Mm -hmm. What do you see a specific difference or, or a specific um, different aspect of this relation to, to the continent and mm -hmm. how the ability of Africans in Europe being able to kind of constantly um, re-engage with their, with, their, with their country of origin is mm -hmm. different? Yeah, for many it's different because, you know, they have a direct connection. So, you know, they'll know I'm going to Ghana, I'm going to Nigeria, but then in the African American experience, because of the harshness of slavery, so many people are cut off from their direct descendants. So it's kind of like you're going to this place that could be totally new to you. But I, just from my um, knowledge, like I've known that a lot of more people are going to Ghana now and Nigeria now, now, you know, people are not so afraid to go to Nigeria, but like, you know, there it's, it's opening up more, a little bit more. You find more um, African-Americans that are traveling to, and Caribbean people going to these different um, places. So yeah, I think that's, that's really a big difference because when I was in a church in, it was fascinating. And this is how I do my research, just to give you this story. I'm in a church with my cousins in London and it just dawned on me because they were doing, their shouting was to some real African rhythms. And I'm like, wow. And it just really blew me away. And I don't know why I was so surprised because of course, right? And then if I'm in the South, it's a, it's, it's a similar movement, but the found, it's, it's just a little bit more far removed. So, and it's more transformed if you're in the South and you go into, you know, or even in Brooklyn, you know, and you go into one of those churches where, you know, people are shouting and doing the whole thing. Like there's something about the energy that's happening there. But it was so interesting that when I was in that space in London, I was like, wow, okay. And that's what it is. I think it's just about the distance. Yeah. Of, um, and time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Wow, what a trip. Uh, Thank you, Adama. We, we really you. appreciate it. I think there were so many questions, of course, and I hope that people will reach out to you maybe directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, feel free, for sure. Yeah, we are, we are so grateful for your time and for your stories and for your art and all the best with the 2021. I hope this will be a better year. Yes, thank you all for having me and thank all the guests. I can't see you, but, you know, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, it was my pleasure, for sure. Thank you. We really appreciate it.